am I allowed to have what I want? Hmm. Am I allowed to have pleasure? Am I like, I mean, that's the question that comes to my mind of where I associate to. Welcome to the Ask Ezra Intimacy Coaching Podcast, a peek behind the curtain of some of the most intimate conversations that people have with Ezra as an intimacy coach. Join us for a session already in progress. Ben, what I'd like to do is learn more about you as an intimacy coach and a writer and a speaker. And once we do that, then we can get into some intimacy coaching stuff and really see what's going on for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm a, yeah, it's kind of like a, a bag, really. I mean, I yeah. am a writer. Uh huh. I write erotic content for Himeros TV, in which I'll show up, you know, and do those intimacy coordinating gigs for them. I haven't uh-huh. done any for other groups. Um, I teach retreats. So I teach with a Tantra teacher, I co-facilitate and bring some like sex therapeutic material to that space. And I also teach with Court Vox, who is a um, a surrogate and practitioner in Los Angeles. So we also have our own sort of curriculum. And then we're working with clients, I'm a sex counselor. So I just do Zoom counseling with mostly men, male identified people. Um, and so with all of that, I kind of like find my way. <laughs> And where does, um, where do you do those? Are those like universities or, you know, retreats or things, you know? Where yeah, do... retreats. I'm also modern sex therapy institutes. I've taught some classes for them. Mm-hmm. Um, the film stuff with, you know, Hammer's TV. Yeah. Podcasts. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I think I spoke with Court Vox when I was investigating, uh, becoming, uh, an intimacy coach because Mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of men in the field and being i'm you know close to la so he was definitely on the list so Mm, i cherish court he's such a a light i love working with him he's also a dom so it's really fun to like work Mm -hmm. with this big masculine body but his heart is so permeable and available and it's it's in his eyes it's in his you know so it's really it's a special experience to work with him on site with, with other people that are coming to explore those themes. Wonderful. Yeah. I do think we had a phone call or something. He was generous with his time. So I appreciate that. And um, it's also, I don't, I'm not often confronted with my sort of wiggliness of gender, except when you're up against something that's like, he's so, he's so masculine and um. I mean, I'm masculine, but I'm also feminine and then also yeah. in the middle and, you know, very totally. different. He like definitely wears the badge of male capitalist uh, masculine as socialized in the Western world. But yeah. Just genetically, it's not like you know, it's, he's like, I was born in this body and like <laughs> people yeah. kind of project onto him a lie. And he's just mm-hmm. like, but what about me? When do I get to be the small one? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm not disparaging that that you know, presentation at all. Um, but I, and I totally get that that's ripe with, you know, the, the possibility of projection. I think a lot of people, you know, have a hard time sometimes or a great time depending, you know, They're like, Oh, you look like my dad. <laughs> well, I love this because this might be a good, I don't know if this is a good segue for you or not, but like the projection piece of where it's impossible not to project, but we're mm-hmm. always projecting and making meaning of everything we see and experience. And then it's like, but what about that? Like, using that to break down our Mm -hmm. assumptions and keep growing and, you know, expand. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's everything, right? The world is everything. And so you get a big enough group of people and there are people who are uh, not projecting. There are people who are projecting in a productive way. There are people who are projecting in an unproductive way. And so you just get everything, you know, if you, if you try hard enough. So Mm -hmm. Tell me, you mentioned a little bit about your um, intimacy coaching practice and how you primarily work with men and and male identifying people. Tell me, you know, what does that look like for you? Mm. It is, so it's Zoom counseling really, but I have a, the coaching aspect of it is it's directive, right? You know, so it's different than therapy where people will go to therapy and it's like, you know, lar- j- largely client led and like this ongoing process that's mostly, most often like a weekly thing for me. 
I prefer when people have been through therapy already or are in therapy and mm-hmm. kind of do the work that I'm doing in an adjunctive kind of way, because what I will do is say, like, kind of like, well, where's the stuck spot for you right now around sex and intimacy or whatever it is that's presenting for them in their in their lives. And whether that's like a physical thing, like their boners are coming and going or whether, you know, or an emptiness feeling or whatever it is around that space. And then we have conversations. And then what I will do is like pull out stuff that I deliberately want them to go work on and expose themselves to Mm -hmm. kind of like expose their nervous systems to whatever conditions are feeling threatening or scary and um, do reflection work, you know, journaling, reflection, we interpret fantasies and try to set up like little rituals for them to go and do something you know, to stimulate their process. Mm-hmm. It's not as effective, although useful, uh, but not as effective, I find, for my work when a guy just wants to just have chats about it, you know, and isn't doing that kind of um, work on his own mm-hmm. because then we end up just unpacking and exploring. And for some people, that's where they need to be. You know, that's all they want to do, or, and that's fine. But I think to optimize how I'm working with people, that's the space that we're like, go do this thing, and they do it, and they come back and like, or you know that was hard i didn't want to do it and yeah. Like, yeah let's let's dig you know yeah absolutely i think so often the things that are hard are the things that are productive right so mm-hmm. and yeah. i think it's i think it's really valuable too to like to be able to offer that sort of talk modality as opposed to like getting right into the work because i think a lot of people need they need time to build trust right where they can't just jump into a session and go oh sure yeah you're my my sexuality's in your hands my right. spirituality's in your hands you know they need some time to get get it going and sometimes even with the people who are like really jump into the work they still are like oh okay session 5 now i trust you <laughs> They're like totally. what are we just doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, jumping in is a strategy, right? I mean, yeah. I, and I gauge that, like what you're saying, it is important. I gauge that, like maybe somebody isn't ready for that and I'm sensitive to that and we definitely make space for it. And I, it's not like I refuse clients that just want to just do the top part. Um, but, you know, some people it's like, yeah, let's dive in. Right. You know, and that's like kind of how they present in the world, mm-hmm. but there's yeah. a, that's how they're dealing with maybe the insecurity that another person would deal with insecurity by like shutting down or, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you just can't really tell from the outside always. Yeah, yeah. And I I have this experience, I think I personally experienced it from the other side as well, of like not respecting my own boundaries, and sort of like, yeah, I'll jump in, I don't trust you yet, but I'm jumping in. And then that trust sort of comes later, and then you really get deeper. And it's interesting, you know, hopefully (laughs) we do that with safer people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or you like, I jumped in and then like, and now I'm withdrawing and you know, that it's all really interesting. I try to hold that perspective, like, isn't this all interesting? Nothing is wrong about what's happening for you. Mm-hmm. How, how does this relate to your overall life? Like what, you know, it's more curious about that. And yeah, you know, there are, people will be like, I didn't do my homework. And I'm like, I, you know what? We're not going to give you any more homework. Well, no, I want to do homework. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm like, oh, okay, well, then it sounds like you're doing your homework. You're watching your resistance or you're what mm, that's great. Let's listen, yeah. you know, and then like, oh. Yeah. So often there's like an excuse to give up, be like, oh, I didn't do it right. So I have to quit kind totally. of thing. Or I'm not you pleasing know. the teacher that yeah, kind of like, oh, yeah. I'm not going to be that for you right now. <laughs> that's extra. <laughs> yeah. You want to be in trouble. <laughs> that's a different service. We can do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very different. Let's talk about that and declare it consciously. <laughs> uh-huh, sure. Sure. Um, I love, I was, I was looking on your website and there was this like unfuck your sex life. Yeah. I love that. So what is what does unfuck your sex life mean? I don't know, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's like I actually so that phrase came from um I used a service called Storyhouse Creative. They're like a marketing group in uh-huh. San Francisco. When I was doing this website like a couple years ago, three or four years ago, and they had an interview with me and we talked and talked and talked. And I part of how I was wanting to uh represent my work was like that I want to provoke. Like I want to provoke. I'm not I, the kind of work that I do is not like, okay, let's just wait and see what happens as much as like, I'm kind of like, oh, you're kind of provoking. And so when people want that, so that, that phrase to me just kind of has that kind of like a little bit of provocation, a little bit of risky, mm-hmm. you know, and I like that. I always kind of like being a little rebellious and it just means kind of like, you know, get your, look at your sex life and get it untangled. Like, like really hold 
what's happening. Be honest. Let's look at it and like, you know, hold it in this way where it doesn't have to be as mystifying if we can unpack it and like really be purposeful about how we're engaging around sex. Yeah, that makes sense. And how would you describe like your ideal client? Well, that's a hard question, right? Because it's like, there's the part of me that the personal part of me that likes to work with specific kind of clients, Mm -hmm. like my personal, like, Oh, I love these kind of clients are the ones that are like, Oh my God, I'm in this. And then curious and wanting, you know, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily ideal. Right. Cause sometimes it's like somebody might be really resistant and they've never had anyone just honor that and be with them in the process. And so, so is that fun for me? Not usually. <laughs> But I, for instance, I have like couples sometimes that I work with and like, oh my God, like they're so, they can be so challenging for me sometimes when they start projecting onto me and like kind of making, kind of trying to induct me into that and make me the problem, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm just, and then I'll be like, oh man, I think I'm ready to just kind of like terminate this situation. And then that's when they're like, let's do another month and let's do more, you know? And it's, it's just kind of hard, right? Because my own shit comes up, but I think the ideal client um, in a general sense would be someone who's really ready to explore and is, you know, maybe like I said, in therapy or has been through therapy so that they're really comfortable with those sorts of places and not just like fresh start and like, Oh my God, what's happening and what's coming up in my body. And I feel like there are other people that are more skilled than I am to hold those particular experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And I, I totally agree with like um, intimacy coaching clients that are also in therapy are really well-resourced. And sometimes when we're doing intimacy coaching stuff, we find something and we're like, wow, that's, that's deep. And it's really not my place to work on that, but that's something you can take to your therapist. So that I think is really valuable. And I swear, I ask this question all the time and every time I have like a different answer and for a while, I tried to like come back with the same exact answer and I'm like, now nah, like, let it be different. And so I think like right now, my ideal client is that person who like has already been doing work, but it's like feeling really stuck. They're mm-hmm. like, they're on this like hump that they can't get over and like specifically around um, like transphobia, homophobia, or or um kink phobia like internalized right and Mm. so like how do you how do you really love your body how do you really like celebrate your sexuality Mm. and your gender and really feel like great about it i mean and it's not a hundred percent it's not like you know you're gonna necessarily feel a hundred percent great all the time but like how do you really get into it and really just love it and i think that's that's wonderful because it's almost like they're spring loaded, these particular kinds of clients, like you just need to unhook them from this thing. And then they've got all this energy to move forward and to, and to really work on themselves and really get, get into their own skin in a more comfortable way. That's my favorite kind of client right now. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have a, um, a generalization about how that statement, how do we love our bodies as they are? Um, I think, (laughs) I think it's like, get more comfortable in your skin is probably it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's also like addressing uh, shame and guilt because those are usually the things that, that hold people back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I think too, brother. Yeah. Awesome. It's like, how do you just embrace all the self-loathing and invite it closer and like, love it versus like, Oh no, not me. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Feel it. Like, People, okay. people often say like, how do I, how do I get rid of this feeling? I say, well, feel it. Yeah. Get in bed with it. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. <laughs> right? But that doesn't feel sexy. Like, no, well, no. Like, avoidance doesn't. is definitely not sexy to me. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I've had this experience where <laughs> like this analogy really works about like climbing a mountain and people will go, well, oh, I'm getting tired. I think I need to stop and figure out why I'm getting tired. It's like, like, that's just the process. Like, I understand that. And Mm. the only problem is that you're stopping to look for a problem. Like there really isn't a problem. You're on the hill. You're moving in the right direction. You just keep, you keep sitting down and thinking about it. Right. I love that analogy. Right. Yeah. You are tired because you are moving through stuff, you know? Yeah. 
and there's a balance too. I mean, not to say you can't ever, you know, rest. <laughs> I was like, are you like, <laughs> no, but, but if it's, but if you rest every moment, right, you can't, yeah. you're not going to make any progress. And then it's going to, it's going to feel unproductive because, because you keep backsliding or you keep resting and, and instead of moving forward. So, yeah. I love it. I mean, to this conversation, this is fun. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah. I want to know more too about, um, like, so you said you do uh writing for Hemeros mm-hmm. and um so so it's you just writing a script or like what does that look like yeah like i would i mean and it's kind of tapering off i haven't like i've been spending more time focusing on the book that i'm writing but i for a while i was writing a lot for Hemeros tv and it would be like you write 12 concepts and they all for me would revolve around a particular theme like a central theme and almost like CDs, <laughs> like albums, you know, they'd have like a theme and a particular artwork and that kind of, that just really impacted me when I was younger. Mm-hmm. It's that kind of way of organizing like a project. And so it felt like that, like there's 12 of these films and I'm like, they're all kind of different permutations of a theme or a central kind of axis that they're around. And um, I just get inspired and a lot of it was fed by my own fantasy material or what I was working out with my partner and just kind of like stuff that's up for me in my life. And then that would just kind of be like what I'm writing about. And yeah, it's a process where I would turn it in and then Davey, uh, Wavy, the producer would, Hey, this doesn't work or this does. And here's how you could change this. And then we kind of collaborate on the the final version of that. Awesome. And then do you do anything so you do a lot of writing and you collaborate with the director and then uh, do you do anything on site? Are you an totally. actor? Are you a, no, 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 I don't act. I don't um, show myself in that kind of space for my actual, it's, it, for one, it's not how I want to be like seen. And I don't want to have my body like projected on and I like he's beautiful or he's not beautiful or yeah, it, I don't, it's like, I mm-hmm, want to mm-hmm. go in there and help the people that are actually doing that to like stay in their consciousness about what's happening for them and help support that. So I would go on site and like help, you know, I would hold hold workshops for the actors. Um, Yeah. Just be in each scene and try to help be a touchstone for them. Cause you know, they go into this performance space and then they're not advocating for what they need sometimes and, or they're in a trauma response and nobody's actually able to witness that. And I'm like, Mm. what's happening? You know, we need to like, you know, get this guy to talk or, you know, and, just different ways of helping to support their therapeutic process through that as best as you can on a porn shoot. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, there's like, okay, yeah, I'm totally trying to be conscious. And I'm also like, you know, leaning back and like making sure their body is like visible to the camera and all. It's just like, it's kind of a trip to be honest. Yeah. I, um, I, I wonder too, is there ever something that's like come up where like somebody's ability to perform is keyed into an unhealthy response and you sort of identify that and maybe they can show up better, but, but now they're not performing as well. Has that ever happened? I I mean, I love this question and it's got so many roots to the answer as I see it. And it's kind of like, well, what's, you know, it's like, what's unhealthy. It's hard, right? Cause what I might think is unhealthy might be really healthy for that person at that point in time Mm -hmm. but is it connected to a freeze response absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's like their body may be taking care of them the best they know how in that situation and i'm like but they're choosing this pathway like they're choosing to do this and so Mm -hmm. that's part of the if they can get into it part of the reclamation of like why am i doing porn yeah when i hear them say like oh i really like it i really love sex i'm like that's just really kind of like the that's like the top of the pimple. <laughs> what's, what's really driving this desire in you to be seen, to be expressed, to be adored, um, to be validated, to, you know, I don't know, all kinds of reasons why people are doing it. And um, yeah, so I'll see something maybe and think it means, oh, he's freezing up or he's, you know, um, kind of checking out or he's watching himself on the side of the room or he's like doing what everyone has always told him to do. And, or he's angry and he's not admitting that. And it's obvious to me <laughs> or I'll ask him like, are you, are you feeling anger? No. Yeah. Oh, are you sure? Like maybe, I, well, I am a little angry. Okay. Oh, okay. Why, why are you angry? <laughs> and it's yeah. really important. I think. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that you do speaking gigs. Uh-huh. You, sp- you do speaking uh, engagements. So what does that look like? What do you, um, what do you speak on? 
So this stuff that we're talking about now, mm-hmm, sure. You know, kind of like working with these particular themes, talking about shadow. You know, like what's informing our our presentations in the world is are largely unconscious. You know, and to try to like talk about that and frame it, like the things I love about myself are influenced by also things that I hate about myself and mm. vice versa. And and some of the best things about us are in a shadow place and like hard to claim. And so I love talking about that. I love utilizing mythology to help us like access like a dialogue about stuff that's hard to talk about and like just a modern nomenclature, you know? Um, mm. Yeah. Sex counseling type stuff, you know, male issues. <laughs> If you like the Ask Ezra podcast, then let me know. Comment on your favorite episode. Let us know what you enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. So, yeah, what what is happening for you, Finn? You know, what's your what's your work like these days? Writing is the thing like the little writer in me has always wanted to be what led my life. And it's like when I was a kid, I spent lots of time in creative world and I wasn't encouraged to stay there. I was like encouraged to be a minister. And, you know, I did that to make my dad happy. And like I said, try to change his mind. And, um, I didn't do that. I wanted to, like when I was 18, I wanted to like move to California from Texas and be a writer. And I didn't, you know, so I, I had like just a lot of trauma and I went to ministry school. And so anyway, I've reconnected with the writer and have been writing all along through these projects I've been talking about, but it's been like, but I want to write more creatively, like creative nonfiction and like kind of get into literature and the, the stuff that I love, like, you know, lit, lit fic, you know, and so I've been doing it. I'm part of a two-year program called Draft and I'm working with three different authors that I really love and under their tutelage and in a cohort of 15 people. So kind of like, how do I bring that into my professional life is where I'm at. I'm also teaching some retreats, um, a couple of them this fall, one in September, one in October Mm -hmm. and gearing up for next year. Awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. And if um, if you want to let us know about any of those things in the show notes for, for listeners to to check out you're certainly welcome to to add those in i would love to yeah because i really yeah i want to talk about those retreats and get those out there um one is with court box in september it's a three day and mm-hmm. it's court working together in october it's a five six day residential retreat with jason tantra different kind of material there's some overlap but those definitely are on my website and my calendar awesome awesome so how was that growing up as a you said you were a minister's son. I can't imagine that was the most facilitating space for a non-typical sexuality. No, it wasn't. But I, you know what I'm kind of coming around to more is like, yeah, it was really shitty. It really was. But I think just existentially, like we all are going through something really shitty. And for the longest time, mm. I have had so much anger and blame about my father. He just plays a whack job, like in my opinion, like he's fundamentalist angry he like actually released a podcast this week i listened to his podcast secretly (laughs) and it's like you know the lgbt people they're coming for your kids and you know they're satanists and just a lot of just really a lot of anger and vitriol and i'm just like listening to this you know he's really just oh animated and hateful about drag queens and america's going down the tubes and if we do any like suggest you know things that i think are like what like he's like in the bible you know people will receive the death penalty for being homosexual and I mean, these are his words, right? So it's like growing up in that, there was a lot of suppression and fear. And I, mm. as I've worked through this stuff, which I continue to grapple with it and work through it, like I find that it's what's also, you know, bringing me so much creative power and the ability to feel more love and connection and compassion. Cause it's, I have to, you have to work through that shit to be able to feel more of what you want to feel. And if yeah. you want that, it'd be something else that deeply wounded me. You know, so I'm trying to like just hold that with a kind of like spiritual perspective, which is like, it was horrible. I'm not trying to let him off the hook. And I kind of want to move on. I'm 43 and I'm, I want to like feel more like expanded and just like, hey man, this is all your pain. Yeah. You know, go deal with it. I'm not going to try to like change your mind. You know, that's where I'm at in this moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you mentioned um, wanting to move on from it and wanting to let go. What does that look like when it comes up for you today? 
Well, it's up for me this very week. I'm in the middle of a grief ritual with my partner. Like, it, you know, all those little patterns from our families play out in our relationships. They just play out in the, you know, we hear people say like, you only accept the kind of love that you think you deserve. I was like, what does that really mean? It's like, well, I have an embodied way of being in the presence of love and connection that makes me feel divided and like kind of split around like my sexuality. And just, it's like, I'm rehashing those dynamics and we come into our relationships trying to have a different outcome. So I've had these patterns with my partner. I've been with him for seven years and we just keep cycling around our little attachment wounds and the, you know, we have really good times and then we have ruptures and that's kind of what we've been going through. And we've decided to do a grief ritual where we're going to take an item that we both really love and get rid of it. Not because we don't want it anymore. Like I always am cleaning out stuff, but this is like, no, no, take something that you actually really love and you don't want to get rid of and go, let it go. Because it represents like, I have to say goodbye to these like illusions in my head, my defenses and the ways that I protected myself from the pain. If I want to, you know, step into more power. So I came across this, well, I was like, what am I going to get rid of? What am I going to get rid of? <laughs> I, there's like this little treasure chest that I have that I got from my grandma that was my dad's when he was a little boy and when I was a kid I always thought it was like magical and I like just put stuff in there like these little one of my little secret things that I would fill <laughs> um, I painted on this chest over the years and I had this idea this week I was like I'll get rid of the chest and then you know what happened I was like no you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna write my dad a letter say everything that needs to be said and like put it in the letter and send it to him and just had this fantasy of like touching his heart, you know, and him like, you know, like wanting to really touch my father. And, and I heard that and it, that might be really a beautiful thing to do, but I also was like, you want to change his mind still. Like that's his work to do. That's not mine. So I was like, no, 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 I'm not, not going to do that. So I'm like going to take this chest out to the river and leave it for somebody else to find and someone will pick it up and think it's really cool <laughs> um and just say i'm not gonna keep doing that with this man like it's just that's not my work you know my work is to really step more deeply into my own power without his approval you know what if you wrote the letter and put it in the chest and then, then gave the chest find away. it <laughs> yeah. gonna find that letter <laughs> they don't want to read that <laughs> they read my book <laughs> yeah there you go yeah you gotta get the book yeah you want to know what's in the letter you have to buy Finn's book. Yes. Yes. Go subscribe <laughs> on my website. <laughs> Fantastic. What a promo. Yeah. Um, does that I answer love... your question? Does it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it absolutely does. I mean, I love that. Um, like active grieving is something that there's so little of in our, in our culture. And I think it's so important to, to like make space for those feelings. Right. Yeah, do, do, I don't know if you were ever into Alanis Morissette or not, but she had a song called Precious Illusions. Like, I think in the 2000s, anyway, it was like these precious illusions in my head did not let me down when I was defenseless. And parting with them is like parting with a childhood best friend. Wow. And I, just, I listen to that song all the time because I'm like, it is. It's just like saying goodbye to part of myself to blame my partner, to blame my dad, to blame, you know, I just want to like be free from that if I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just my best, the best of my ability. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you mentioned you're partnered. How, um, has it been a long time or? Yeah. Seven years together. Mm -hmm. Seven years. Somebody said there was like an evolutionary, um, development for like a six year mark, because that's how long it takes to like raise a child to the point where they won't just like fall in the river and die by themselves so um so like people stay together for six years you know because the species does better when they do that and so i sort of think there's like a second clock that starts at six years uh -huh. so you know so you're at six plus one there you go yeah yeah i'm a toddler <laughs> like literally in some ways i am a toddler in my relationship mm, say more it's about like, that yeah like feeling safe you know it's like all these like splits and, you know, it's, I'm obsessed around the sex thing, right? Cause that's my work. That's my life. That's like what I'm, but it's like knowing how to like integrate the parts of myself that like might feel really safe with someone that's anonymous, but with my partner can't access or just being able to receive attention, you know, like him giving me a blow job and being able to actually feel it and really like, and get off because it feel you know, versus like, you know, and shrinking and being small or mm. this, Oh, so many little these. Yeah, I this is something that kind of happens. Sometimes he'll like watch me get undressed before bed. And instead of being like, yeah, and just kind of like getting into it, I'm all 
you know, like shy. And it's I'm like, this is the thing that's high. It's like physiological, right? It's like my nervous system and needing to feel safe. And, you know, this is all kind of new that we're talking about this in a, in a more transparent way, because a lot of times in the past, I would see how he hides from me and be hyper-focused on that and angry at him mm. instead of being able to really fully acknowledge and own how I feel divided and how I organize those things and split things up, you know, kind of hide from him. And yeah, you were talking about projection before that's, that's what that sounds like. You know, you're angry at yourself for hiding. So you catch him hiding and, and point the finger. Yeah. Hiding and shutting myself down. Mm, yeah. He's not making me like collapse. It's like, that's my body. So what if any strategies have like felt productive for you in that experience of hiding and shutting down? Is there anything like once that happens, is there anything that, that you find is helpful to sort of get you into a better space or does it, you sort of need to let the dust settle? For me, it's been a combo of like my therapy. I've been in therapy for seven years too, which I've <laughs> love my therapist and that connection with her has really helped me grow a lot and be able to tolerate I don't know exactly I've always think of her as kind of like a magician like what is she doing to me behind the scenes like how is she like showing up in ways that are helping me remodel how I respond but it, there's a connection between that process with her and with my partner so there's the healing work and like being able to talk about these things and then my partner's ability and capacity to hear it and like actually empathize, right? That creates mm -hmm. the, the bridge. But then there's like the physiological work in real time. That's just like, this feels icky. That's okay. Let's just be with it. You know, when it can feel so like you can feel so shut down and like, you know, and um, be like, that's okay. We're going to lay here and let this pass. This will pass. We're okay. Like no one's mm -hmm. in trouble here. No one's, no one's wrong. And that takes some I'm going to stay, you know, some discipline, but I have buy-in from him, you know, and I didn't always. And when I didn't, it was more like erratic for me and like, yeah, more prone to blaming him. <laughs> and when you say buy-in, what do you mean by that? Like, like, let's just say I feel a kind of like stuckness in me. And instead of him feeling stuck too, because of that, and then we both kind of pull away from each other, which just happens all the time in couples. So we don't have good chemistry. It's like, well, actually mm -hmm. what's happening is you're having a, a, a healing opportunity there. That's not being met necessarily, you know, that's all sometimes, you know? And yeah. so we'll like, maybe if that happens where we used to kind of maybe pull away from each other for a little while, we're actually just like, no, no, I'm with you. <laughs> and like, talk about it. It's just, fuck it. I hate this. And like, get up in a different position, like change your body position. Like until you can kind of find that, like, okay, I'm me again. The me that I like, I'm back, you know? Mm. and then it patterns it's like that wasn't scary that wasn't bad like you just kind of learn like it's okay i'm not gonna lose love for this i'm back i'm here i can find this place in my body again it feels so scary to me like when it feels like i can't find it and it's never gonna come and yeah it's never gonna happen i'm never gonna feel free you know <laughs> yeah yeah just stories right oh and my I god think, it is <laughs> yeah and you know i love this analogy of like a broken smoke alarm like imagine a smoke alarm that just goes off without smoke, right? And so at first you panic every time and there's no smoke, but you're but you're panicking every time. Eventually, maybe you learn to ignore it. And like the alarm isn't an indicator that something's wrong, right? And so you're talking about feeling icky and and staying with feel, staying with that feeling, right? Okay, so the alarm's going off. We're still here, right? Totally. It, I love that analogy. Right? It's like we're still here. Can we just actually soften to this sound instead of bracing against it? And it's just like, oh wow, that's really hard to listen to. Oh yeah, I hear it. Oh, it's getting on my nerves. Me too. Okay, let's just how can how can I tolerate that? You know, that's a different approach than like this goddamn thing and you know, uh -huh, like that's uh -huh. what. Yeah, I think the other side to that analogy too is sometimes there is a fire and you learn to ignore <laughs> the smoke alarm. Yeah. And you need to learn different mechanisms for mm -hmm. determining if there's a fire because that alarm isn't helpful. And, you know, so I think for, for me, that experience comes up of like, you know, when I'm, when are people crossing boundaries with me? And sometimes I feel like they are when they aren't. But then when people are crossing boundaries with me, I might ignore it because uh, the alarm has been going off forever, right? 
So, you know, you got to It's tricky. You know, you, that yeah. smoke alarm is not helping. So you got to know, you got to know when there's smoke around. Yeah. Like when, really, like, what am I actually experiencing? What am I perceiving? Mm-hmm. Kind of being more in contact with that, being more clear. Is yeah, I'm fantastic. Music. Is your, um, is your partner also um, doing any kind of coaching or therapy or is it, so are you doing it all for them? <laughs> Well, there's a thing that runs in our relationship around that I'm older. I'm a little older than him. He's 36. Mm-hmm. I'm 43. So there's this kind of like, we bring in a natural kind of like big brother, little brother dynamic that's mm-hmm. kind of central to us, which that has its ups and downs, right? So sometimes there's been me, but also it's just my attachment stuff. Like I drive the conversation a lot because I am interested sure. and I'm like, we're going to talk about it, you know? And, and he's more like, oh, if we just don't talk about it, I guess those feelings will go away, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so like that sets me up for a lot of like, no, but that's some of the one I meant when I meant reference like attachment patterns with us when uh-huh. we kind of work through these things and feel safe. And yeah. so he is now he's actually um, in the last couple of years, he's studying contemplative psychology, it's okay. Buddhist influence psychology and is a body worker and a Hakomi practitioner. It's a mindfulness centered, like psychotherapy type technique and yeah he teaches massage so he's in his own work too and it's Mm -hmm. kind of different but like there's connections that we are finding more and more with each other's worlds yeah well and i think that that happens so often and i you know i'm going to make sure that it it doesn't feel like it's a less than experience of like you know one partner or one person starts doing like a lot of work and then somebody goes oh you mean you can change that i thought i had to live with this forever And then they sort of pick up the work as well, even if maybe they don't access the same resources, but just because you've got that as an example, you know, they can, they have access to that all of a sudden sometimes. Totally. And that's part of our, that's what I mean when I say like the healing work, right? To take agency over the pain. Cause like for me, I've been schooled as a child onward to like care about other person's feelings over mine Mm. to manage everything I can about perception and appearance and to like track the other person more than myself. And so for the longest time, it's like, well, you're not this and you're not that. And like me tracking him versus being like, oh, actually what I feel is like, if I do the work on myself, I actually feel scared of leaving him because Mm -hmm. that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. So I'll just like kind of contract and then say that I can't do it because him and, you know, kind of like blame him again. It's like this thing. And now that I've been breaking free of that over the last couple of years of like, and it creates a natural space where then he's like, well, I want to do the work too. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to do it. I'm like, yeah. it has to come from him anyway. It can't come from me. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and how, how much more attractive it is to be like, Hey, I'm going to do the work. You can join me if you want to, as opposed to like, Hey, you need to do work. Or I'm going right? to leave. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. like manipulative strategy to say, I'm really scared. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and like, like a therapist would be like, so why aren't you leaving? <laughs> because I like to be stuck and I like to have someone to be angry at. <laughs> <laughs> How very insightful. <laughs> yeah. Because leaving is like, I can't even imagine that. So no, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. The ambivalence, right. Is like kind of learning to be mature, I think is learning to hold ambivalence in a relationship and be able to be comfortable with that. We're in different tracks sometimes and it takes on different permutations and just kind of grow through that versus like, yeah, I need to squeeze him along in a certain process. And then it's like totally narcissistic too, because for me, because it's like, where am I blind to what I'm not coming along with that he's feeling a deep agony about, you know? It's yeah, absolutely. My problems and your <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like we're in a room full of people who are who are boxing and you're like, I would like to ballroom dance. And so, you know, it's like that's way more fun, but it's not fun to ballroom dance while getting punched in the face. So you know, like you got to convince people to do it with you. You can't, you know, this sort of like nonviolence um, is great way to live, but, um, but also in the face of violence, it can be really, really challenging to, to live like that. So. I totally agree. I love the analogy. And I kind of want to see a ballroom dancer in a room of boxers and kind of see how they navigate that situation. So here's an interesting question is like, what is the most challenging component of your growth? I mean, maybe we've already touched on it, but you know, what's that, what's that hill that's in front of you that you go, I know I'll get over it, but Mm. you know, I'm not there yet. 
Yeah, I'd say we have touched on it and it's maybe twofold as I imagine it right now. One of them is one piece of that is like being able to really fully like take full ownership of my pain and my own associations about what's happening mm. and just hold it, you know, like this is mine. Yeah. And that connects to the second part is like, this is also my body and the way my body responds. And so like being able to feel like I can be all of me when I want to versus like in certain circumstances, you know, like feeling like, oh, it's really hard to show up. Is this like really like, I don't know, like really hungry sexual person right now with this other man because like, does he does he want that and, not, and like all that kind of stuff that starts happening right is this okay sure mm-hmm. you're like the fear of rejection like but just to like stand in it and be like yeah this is me you know and to have that physiological like power and not feel like i lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it but just you know more consistency around that is where i'd say my physical work is right now am i allowed to have what i want mm. am i allowed to have pleasure in my life I mean that's the question that comes to my mind of where I associate to and also like I don't know have you read Jack Moran's um The Erotic Mind I haven't no which what is it again it's called The Erotic Mind by Jack Moran he's a sex therapist or late sex therapist that um this book is so cool I think you might dig it um but there's this a script that we have our erotic scripts and one of the scripts that's central to many of us is um longing and anticipation mm-hmm it's almost like the, the the not having it is more fun than the having it. <laughs> and there's some gratification in that, but it's also connected to a pain point, which is I wasn't allowed to have or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's both and it's functioning in a way that we both love and hate. Yeah, I think for me, the thing, the, the dialogue that like works against my progress is like, but I really enjoy performance. I enjoy, you know, pleasing my partner. I enjoy when my partner works really hard to please me, but that's really bullshit because I still have access to that if I choose to perform, mm-hmm. right? I still, if I have the choice to do it, if I'm doing it mindfully, I still have access to all of those things. It's about like doing it compulsively. It's about being stuck in performance versus being choiceful in performance. Absolutely. It's like the mobility, right? To be in it because you put it on versus like, I can't I know this, I'm stuck here. And it's like, way of being (laughs) yeah yeah and it's i mean i'm so blessed to have partners who are like please be selfish please you know like that's so rich of an opportunity to be like okay i have full permission from my partner to like focus on my pleasure and to and to really enjoy it as much as possible um and so i'm i'm going to do my best to take full advantage of that rich opportunity yeah (laughs) <laughs> and i'll be interested to know what comes up along the way in changing yeah. your, beha- your behavioral stance because then it's like what's bubbling up around that you know all the things that kind of change when our scaffolding shifts <laughs> i know it feels like, like oh god it, it feels like humble bragging like finn i have a problem i last forever yeah <laughs> okay but do you feel anything in the way there <laughs> on the way to forever what do you feel frustrated okay <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> Uh-huh. How does that feel? <laughs> Who's coaching who? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, this is why I love having, you know, intimacy coaches as, as guests because it becomes a two-way street and I think that's really beautiful. So mm-hmm. Finn, thank you so much for showing up. It's been a real pleasure and I'm really, um, I'm really happy to have you as a friend, Finn. You know, I, uh, I look up to you in, mm-hmm. in the cool things you're doing and someday I want to be as cool as you. Well, I, let me just take that in. I appreciate that a lot. And it's like, it's sweet to hear that. And I also have to tell you, I look up to you too. Like in a, this mind fucking mindfully book, I'm like, God, if I could just like be all those things, like it just really speaks to um, the part of me that really loves being sadistic and doesn't have a a history of like really standing in that in a conscious kind of way. And, you know, there's, it confronts all kinds of things, right? Fear of rejection and that. Yeah. Me. And, um, but I've been working on it and I, your book really influenced me and I have it on my little, my, like, these are some of the books that are like active in my Wonderful. process right now. Yeah. It's I'm, right there. I'm it's touched. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm touched. Yeah. Maybe if you want, I help you workshop something. I'm always down to do some like, you know, creative work. So totally. Oh my God. Yeah, totally. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Finn. And um, if people want to get a hold of you, how can they do that? 
So go to findyourheart.com, F-I-N-N-D-E-E-R-H-A-R-T.com. And there's a contact me tab there. Or if you just prefer email, finn at findyourheart.com. Fantastic. Thanks again. And I'll talk to you soon. Mm, Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching the Ask Ezra Intimacy Coaching Podcast. Support our show at patreon.com slash askezra. Join us at the personal growth tier and receive a special thank you on the next podcast episode. A very special thank you to both Sarah Nash and Deb Matson for being Patreon supporters at the personal growth tier and helping make the Ask Ezra Intimacy Coaching Podcast possible.